Today we're looking at the second part of the fourth lecture in the winter 1931 term. We ended last time considering the idea of the blood baptism, an understanding of initiation unacceptable to what is now Orthodox Christian doctrine. It was suggested based on empirical evidence, contrary to the argumentation of the Orthodox, that the human and divine are separate as distinct but united persons, rather than natures within the same person. According to the Orthodox, there is one person, the Logos, which joins the human nature to its transcendental person. Based on psychological evidence, however, it was suggested that two persons exist, the joining of which requires no transcendental term, not least because this transcendental term occasions an equivocation. J. F. Bethune-Baker quotes Nestorius, who preserves this duality and leaves out the transcendental term in his Nestorius and his teaching, as writing, quote, The Godhead becomes the subject of human experiences by taking to itself that which is the center of human experiences, and the manhood becomes in turn the subject of divine experiences, by being taken up into the center of divine experiences. It should be said that Nestorius himself thought that the result of this trade was a single person, and the so-called Nestorian Church of the East preserves a more subtle version of this suggestion with the introduction of the mediating Noma. Let's then consider Christiana's next vision. Here the natives then flee from the sacrificial scene, whereupon the visioner asks a new native why they have fled. The native, with many animals behind him, answers that it is because she has, quote, violated the blood. Jung goes on to interpret this to refer again to deification, the rejection of the human qualities of earth and blood, or most importantly, that the visioner has yet to discover her shadow qualities. Recall a shadow quality is an element of the personality which has become unconscious because of an inability to integrate it. To quote Jung at length, he says, quote, Our inflations come from illusions about ourselves. That is shown in our continuous attempts to live above our level or below our level. Our ignorance of the human being as he is really meant to be is a violation of the blood and particularly when we try to live above our level. His comments then become particular to the individual, the visioner, who he says is in this state. She is not living as a natural person, a human being, but lives above herself, and in so doing, her animus, her connection to the unconscious, has, quote, married her shadow and gone to hell. Because of her unconsciousness of her shadow qualities, her masculine qualities are divorced from her concrete reality and have taken charge, though without reference to the concrete world. This is in contrast to, to recall the first part of Lecture 3, the state in which a person feels a relationship between conscious and unconscious elements, between self and the world, in which the elements encountered from the latter are isomorphic with, that is, they represent, elements of the former. This establishes the harmonious relationship between them. But the visioner is not in this state. She has made the latter her enemies just because they are, as Jung says, on the other side of the moat, and she is, for whatever reason, unable to realize that it is, quote, all just as much her mud. She is unaware of the shadow in her unconscious, which, if made conscious, would tame her uncontrolled masculinity. The same would be true of a man who, realizing the unconscious qualities of his personality, would not be under the possession of his feminine side. To violate the blood is to be without connection to the shadow. The next lecture will consider the connection of this violation of the blood to blood baptism, but in the context of inflation in this lecture, we might comment on the condemnation of Nestorius, whose writings reflected a desire to preserve the ecstatic relationship of man and God. In the early church, we recall, there was even in orthodoxy the idea that man may become like God. To this extent, Christology is not just a theory of God, but of man becoming like God. In this connection, then, the suggestion may be justified that the introduction of the transcendental term in the orthodox Christology might induce this kind of inflation considered in this lecture, and that the ecstatic duality of the human and divine would better avoid this problem.